Thank you, President Hennessy, uh, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to all of the colleagues, many colleagues and friends uh, here at Stanford for the opportunity to be with you today. It's a special privilege for me to give the Sydney Drell Lecture. And I need to tell you why. I began my career, as John Hennessy indicated, in elementary particle physics. And the classic textbook in relativistic quantum field theory, which described the first of what are known as gauge field theories, namely quantum electrodynamics, was entitled Burkane and Drell, Relativistic Quantum Fields. I got my copy of Burkane and Drell right here. It's all marked up in the margins from those years ago. Uh, for my doctoral thesis in theoretical physics, I worked on quantum chromodynamics, which is also a gauge theory, a field theory uh, of the force by which quarks are held together to make nucleons. And at Oxford's Department of Theoretical Physics, the external thesis advisor for my thesis was Sid Drell. And I, I talked to Sid earlier this morning. He can't be here, but that's my thesis back in the days when they were bound. When I visited the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in subsequent years as a postdoc, I remember sitting on the porch of the rambling ranch house right here on the Stanford campus that Sid and Harriet Drell lived in. As postdocs tend to do, I would hang around their house at dinner time, <laughs> hoping that Harriet would invite me in to dinner, <laughs> which she usually did. And sometimes their daughter, Persis, would be there, who is now, of course, the Dean of Engineering here at Stanford. A few years later, Sid was assisting the assembly of a team of scientists for the US Congress on a topic that preoccupied Cold War Washington at the time, how to base the 10 warhead MX intercontinental ballistic missile so that it could not be destroyed in a first strike by 3,000 equivalent megatons of Soviet throw weight atop their SS-18 missile. He recommended that I join that team temporarily. Sid Drell was an inspiration to all those who worked in those years to control the danger of nuclear weapons. And this, for me, was the beginning of my involvement in national security affairs. At about that time, I got to meet the then Under Secretary of Defense in charge of technology and procurement for the Department of Defense. He impressed me with how lucid and logical he was and how well he applied technical thinking to national security problems. That undersecretary was, of course, William Perry, who's also present here today and who later became Deputy Secretary of Defense and finally Secretary of Defense in a progression that I've followed some 30 years later. Bill's been a major figure in my life, including standing in for my father at my wedding. So I thank both Sid and Bill Perry and many, many other colleagues here at Stanford, old friends at CSAC, at the Friedman Spogli Institute, the Hoover Institution, and in the engineering faculty. I especially thank everyone for their warm welcome to me as a visitor here earlier this year. Not quite two months into it, on a fateful Monday afternoon in November, though, duty called. And I found myself nominated by President Obama to be Secretary of Defense. When I, made, when I became Secretary, I made three commitments. The first is to the troops and to their families, to safeguard them, to ensure that they're treated with dignity and respect and above all, to ensure that when they're sent into harm's way, it's done with the utmost care. My second commitment is to President Obama, to offer him my best strategic advice as he faces a complex world, to ensure at the same time that he receives candid military advice, and finally, that his decisions are carried out with DOD's expected excellence. My third commitment is to the future, to stay ahead of a changing world, 
to stay competitive, to stay aware of new generations and attract them to our mission of serving the country, and to stay abreast of technology. All this the topic of my comments today. Over the years, I've seen lots of products developed here in Silicon Valley and throughout the tech community to enable boundless transformation, progress, opportunity, and prosperity across all sectors of our economy and society, commerce, healthcare, education, transportation, and national defense, among many others. And it's made many things easier, cheaper, and safer. But in recent years, it's been, become clear that these same advances and technologies also present a degree of risk to the businesses, governments, militaries, and individual people who rely on them every day, making it easier, cheaper, and safer to threaten them. The same internet that ena enables Wikipedia also allows terrorists to learn how to build a bomb. And the same technologies we use to target cruise missiles and jam enemy air defenses can be used against our own forces, and they're now available to the highest bidder. Whether it's the cloud, infrared cameras, or the GPS signals that provide navigation for ride-sharing apps, but also for aircraft carriers and our smart bombs, our reliance on technology has led to real vulnerabilities that our adversaries are eager to exploit. And this brings me to my question for today. How do we mitigate that risk, the risk that comes with technology while simultaneously unleashing its promise? How do we protect not just the freedom the internet affords and the new opportunities to advance human welfare that technology enables, but also our country, our future, our children, our people? And the key, in my mind, is to assure alignment between a defense that leverages our strengths, like our robust and independent business and academic communities, and that reflects our nation's values and longstanding traditions, and a defense that is effective in a changing world. How to align all that. And how we achieve that alignment isn't new. We find the alignment in open partnership by working together. Indeed, history shows that we've succeeded in finding solutions to these kinds of tough questions when our commercial, civil, and government sectors work together as partners. And today we must and can do the same. Looking out over the last 75 years, we've had a long history of partnership. Sometimes the bonds, sometimes the bonds between the academy, industry, and defense were particularly close, like during World War II, when the Manhattan Project, the MIT Radiation Laboratory, and others brought together the brightest minds, and the best of industry cranked out ships, planes, and tanks in what are now astonishing to us numbers. And another was during the Cold War, when a cross-section of military, academic, and private sector experts paved the way to a future of precision-guided munitions, battle networks, and stealth. At times, we also eyed each other warily, like when Bobby Inman faced off against Martin Hellman and Whit Diffie over public key encryption and commercialization, during the, or during the controversy over the clipper ship, chip clipper chip, excuse me, in the 1990s, and more recently after the actions of Edward Snowden. Through successes and strains, our ties have broadly endured, but I believe we must renew the bonds of trust and rebuild the bridge between the Pentagon and Silicon Valley. One reason to do so is that we share many of the same underlying objectives and values. As our government has demonstrated in recent trade negotiations, diplomacy, decisions on net neutrality, we are strong proponents of a free and open internet and strong supporters of protecting intellectual property rights. But we also need to work together because we're living in the same world with the same basic trends and the same basic threats. The first of these threat trends is the evolutions we're seeing in technology, which you all know very well about. But second, there's been an evolution for us in where technology comes from. When I began my career, most technology of consequence originated in the United States. And much of that was sponsored by the government. Now much more technology is commercial, and the technology base is global. 
Globalization and commercialization have in turn led to more competition, which is good because it leads to more innovative thinking. But it's driven a third trend, which is the competition for talent has become much more aggressive. Uh, more to say about that later, because that matters a lot to me as Secretary of Defense. These trends are contributing to a growing problem we think about every day in DOD. The fact that threats to our security and our military's technological superiority are proliferating and diversifying. This is happening in terms of conventional weaponry and technologies and in the cyber domain. You may think that some of this could just be left up to DOD, but these challenges should concern us all. Let me step back. During the Cold War, Bill Perry drove a so-called offset strategy that harnessed American technology to radically change warfare through precision-guided munitions, network-centric forces, and stealth aircraft. It came to life during the 1991 Gulf War when the world watched stunned at what the American military might had achieved. But the world has since had a quarter century to figure out how to counter these capabilities. So now we're seeing high-end military technologies long possessed by only the most advanced fo foes find their way into arsenals of both non-state actors and previously much less capable militaries. And nations like Russia and China have been pursuing long-term and comprehensive military modernization programs to close the technology gap with the United States, particularly through capabilities designed to thwart our traditional advantages of power project projection and freedom of movement. They're developing and fielding new and advanced aircraft, submarines, and ballistic, cruise, anti-ship, and anti-air missiles that are both longer range and more accurate. And they've been working on new counter space, cyber, electronic warfare, undersea, and air attack capabilities that challenge our own. And as I'll explain more in a moment, we're of course innovating to stay ahead of these threats, but they're very real. And meanwhile, as tech companies see every day, the cyber threat against, the US, against US interests is increasing in severity and sophistication. While the North Korean cyber attack on Sony was the most destructive on a UN, U.S. entity so far, this threat affects us all. And it comes from state and non-state actors alike. Just as Russia and China have advanced cyber capabilities and strategies ranging from stealthy network penetration to intellectual property theft, criminal and terrorist networks are also increasing their cyber operations. Low cost and global proliferation of malware have lowered barriers to entry and made it easier for smaller malicious actors to strike in cyberspace. And we're also seeing blended state and non-state threats in cyber, which complicates potential responses for us and for others. This is a serious business, a serious matter, and it requires our collaboration. But in addition to dangers, there are great opportunities to be seized through a new level of partnership between the Pentagon and Silicon Valley, opportunities that we can only realize together. Consider the historic role that DOD and government investments have played in helping spur ground up technology innovation, both in this valley and on this campus. Some examples are well known. Vint Cerf fathered the internet, well, a Stanford assistant professor and also a researcher at DARPA. GPS, I don't know if Jim Spilker's here, but likewise began as a defense-driven project, as did in an earlier era, jet engines and communication satellites. And even today, Stanford continues to be among the top university recipients of federal R&D spending. But other examples we hear less about. Work on Google's search algorithm was funded for, by a grant from the NSF, National Science Foundation. Most technologies used throughout Silicon Valley, including many that Apple brilliantly integrated into the iPhone, can be traced back to government or DOD research and expenditures. Developers of multi-touch work together through a fellowship funded by National Science Foundation and the CIA. IOS's Siri grew out of not only decades of DARPA-driven research on artificial intelligence and voice recognition, but also a specific DARPA project funded through SRI to help develop, develop a virtual assistant for military personnel. 
and Google's self-driving cars grew out of the DARPA grand challenge. Now, obviously, none of this diminishes the genius, the hard work, or the sacrifices of the innovators here at Stanford or in Mountain View or Boston or elsewhere. The government helped ignite the spark, but this was the place that nurtured the flame, that created incredible applications. I mention this because it speaks to a partnership that has long existed between America's technology sector and its government and defense institutions, a relationship that can continue in a way that benefits us both. All these facts, both the challenges and the opportunities, lead me to a clear conclusion. Renewing, strengthening our partnership is the only way we can do this. It won't always be easy. We've had tensions before, and we will likely have them again. We shouldn't diminish that. But those who work in the tech community are no strangers to intense grappling with ideas. And the same is true for those of us who work in the Pentagon. And because we have different missions and different perspectives, sometimes we're going to disagree. But I think that's OK. Because being able to address tensions through our partnership is much better than not speaking at all. And there can be great ideas that come out of candid conversation. And this, of course, leads us to a new question. What would this renewed partnership look like? And what's the best way to rewire the Pentagon for a partnership? As Secretary of Defense, I believe that we in the Pentagon, to, to stay ahead, need to change. And to change, we need to be open. As I say, we have to think outside of our five-sided box. So I want to spend the rest of my remarks talking about two areas where I believe our partnership is most vital, innovation more broadly and cybersecurity particularly. And I want to be open with you about our plans for both. Let me start with innovation. It's no secret that DOD is coming out of fighting two wars, two long wars, for more than 10 years. While we were focused on solving the problems we faced during those wars, we lost sight, in some ways, of the bigger picture about the impact and proliferation of technology around the world. And this isn't to say that we completely ceded R&D funding and innovative thinking to any, everyone else. We still make up half of federal research and development, which is about $72 billion this year. These are resources that help build the world's most advanced fighters and bombers, develop new phased array radars, for, or phased arrays for radar, and produce the satellites, missiles, and ships that let us strike terrorists in the Middle East and underwrite stability in the Asia Pacific. And unlike our R&D investments during the past 14 years of war, like when we needed thousands of mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, or MRAPs, to protect our troops from roadside bombs, the investments we're making today are preparing us to face the types of high-end threats that I described earlier. Some of these R&D funds, $12 billion worth, support the breakthrough science and technology research done at universities and companies in DOD labs across the tech community. For example, a number of folks here at Stanford have worked with DARPA, our, uh, our advanced research projects agency, which you all know. These past ye three years, DARPA has partnered with nearly 50 different public and private sector research entities here in Silicon Valley. That's just one agency. These relationships are really valuable to us. And we, I intend to continue to nurture them. Come June, we'll see this in action when the finals take place for the DARPA Robotics Challenge in Southern California. This event will showcase how work on smaller sensors, pattern recognition technology, big data analysis, and autonomous systems with human decision support can combine into a rescue robot. That's the challenge a rescue robot that navigates a disaster-stricken area with the same speed and efficiency that you or I would, but without putting anyone at risk. Another example is how we're looking beyond GPS. While DOD will, of course, continue to support the GPS satellites, which we engineer and launch, because of all its commercial applications as well as military applications, we also need to find alternatives for military use that are more resilient and less vulnerable. We'll do that in part 
by advancing microelectromechanical systems, technology for small inertial navigation units, small accurate accelerometers, and precision clocks all on a chip. Today, this technology is in our smartphones. That's how they know they're being rotated. And we're pushing it to be far more precise. We'll push, for example, the performance envelope and timing and navigation technology by harnessing Nobel Prize winning physics research that uses lasers to cool atoms. Stanford's been a tremendous force in this area. With one group of researchers creating a company we work with, AOSense, to make practical cold atom systems. The result would be a GPS of things, akin to the Internet of Things, where objects, including our military systems, keep track of their position, orientation, and time from the moment they are created, with no need for updates from satellites. But to, do, to stay competitive and to stay ahead of threats, DOD must do even more. And that starts with our people, who are our most important asset, both in Silicon Valley and in the military. Who they are and where they are matters tremendously in affecting our ability to innovate. And that's the rationale behind some initial steps I'm taking starting today. First of all, it's important that we in the Pentagon find new ways to help bring in new people with the talent and expertise we need and who want to contribute to our mission as part of the force of the future, even if only for a time or a project. We're establishing a DOD branch of the US Digital Service, the outgrowth of the tech team that helped rescue healthcare.gov, for example, to help solve some of our most intractable IT and data problems in DOD. And in fact, we have our very first team their sprint team already in the Pentagon working on transferring electronic records from DOD to the Veterans Administration, uh, a bigger problem than you might imagine. Uh, and they'll work on classified projects as well. If you want to be part of the digital service, you can. And it's a wonderful opportunity to try out public service, try out applying your skills to national defense, and maybe you'll end up like I did after Sid Drell got me to give it a try. But that's what we're trying to do. Ask people to give us a try. Join us for a while, even if for just a time. Make a contribution. Feel what it's like to be part of something that's bigger than yourself, and that really matters. Uh, the reason that Silicon Valley is so successful is that it has the right people in it, but there's proximity. Uh, as well. There's an ecosystem out here. Everyone's in the same general area, which not only helps forge relationships, but also helps spread new ideas. And that geographic proximity, coupled with strong links between academia and industry, has made this entire region a nexus for innovation. So I am also creating something we call the Defense Innovative Unit Experimental, uh, first of a kind for us, staffed by some of our best active duty and military personnel, plus key people from the reserves who live here, who are some of our best technical talent. Some of you are reservists, and we appreciate that. They'll strengthen existing relationships and build new ones, help scout for new technologies, and function as a local interface for the department. Down the road, they can help startups find new work to do with DOD. Third, we're going to open a door in the other direction, from our best government technologies to industry and then back. For example, we current have, currently have what are called Secretary of Defense, corporate fellows. It sends about 15 of our, uh, per year of our people out to commercial companies like Oracle, Oracle Cisco, FedEx, others. Now, right now, we don't effectively harness what they've learned when they come back. So I'm going to try expanding that fellows program into a two-year gig, one year in a company and one year in a part of DOD with comparable business practices. That way, we have a better chance of, to bring the private sector's best practices back into the department. 
These are just some of the examples of how we need to uh, drill holes in the wall that I think exists and has been built up over the years before the, between the Department of Defense and the commercial and scientific sector and let people come back and forth and try it out. It's the only way to do it. People want choices these days and they want mobility. They don't want to get stuck uh, on one side of a wall or the other. We also have to think about investing in the most promising er emerging technologies as well as our people. Well, we've sought to continuously improve our acquisition processes over the last five years, and I'm proud to have been part of that effort at the beginning of the Obama administration. There are still areas where we can and must do better. One concern I've heard about is the worry that the government will insist on taking intellectual property and then reveal proprietary information to the public and to competitors. Let me assure you that we understand and appreciate industry's right to intellectual property. And DOD has a long history of successfully protecting companies' proprietary information. And we respect the fact that IP is often the most important and valuable asset a company holds, and that business cannot be forced to sell their IP to the government. We understand all that. We need the creativity and innovation that comes from startups and small businesses. And we know that party, part of doing business with them involves protecting their intellectual property. This is particularly important because startups are the leading edge of commercial innovation. And right now, DOD researchers have many effective ways to transition promising, I mean, sorry, do not have enough promising ways to transition technologies that they come up with to application. And we need to fix that too. I don't want to lose out an innovative idea or capability we need because the Pentagon bureaucracy was too slow to fund something or we weren't amenable to working with startups as we should be. So borrowing on the success of the intelligence community's partnership with the independent nonprofit startup backer InQtel, which many of us have had an involvement with, I'm going to uh, Propose, I have proposed, and they've accepted a pilot project within QTEL to provide innovative solutions to our most challenging problems. We'll make investments within QTEL in order to leverage their existing proven relationships and apply their approach to DOD. As some of you know, InQtel has been working with Silicon Valley for over 15 years and continues to provide other parts of the U.S. government with access to the startup world. In order to regain our competitiveness, we have to expand our ways of investing and in identifying and implementing new technologies and capabilities. And this approach may help us yield a long-term advantage. And commercial technology, I should say, is not a panacea, nor will it ever be. We can't get everything from outside, and we need some special technologies for our own special missions. Stealth is one example. We need aircraft to look as tiny as sparrows on radar, but nobody else needs aircraft in the commercial world that do that. Similarly, the Mach 5 plus hypersonic scramjet we tested on the X-51 a couple years ago is technology we need for a dimension in warfighting. It's not something the commercial sector needs. But there are many areas where the potential in leveraging commercially driven technology is so huge that we have to embrace it. We want to partner with businesses on everything from autonomy to robotics, to biomedical engineering, power, energy, propulsion, to distributed systems, data science, Internet of Things. Because if we're going to leverage these technologies to defend our country and help make a better world, the Defense Department cannot do everything in all these areas alone. We have to work with those outside. And the same is true, finally, with cybersecurity. We're going to have to work together on this one. While we in DD, DOD are an attractive target the cyber threat is one we all face as institutions and as individuals. Networks nationwide are scanned millions of times a day. And as we've seen cyber attackers bombard the public websites of banks, make off with customer data from retailers, try to access critical infrastructure networks, and steal research and intellectual property from universities and businesses alike, so too have individual citizens been compelled to guard against identity theft. 
This is one of the world's most complex challenges today, which is why the Department of Defense has three missions in cyber, the cyber domain. The first is defending our own networks and weapons, because they're critical to what we do every day. They're no good if they've been hacked. Second, we help defend the nation against cyber attacks from abroad, especially if they would cause, lo cause loss of life, property destruction, or significant foreign policy and economic consequences. And our third mission is to provide offensive cyber options that, if directed by the president, can augment our other military systems. In some ways, what we're doing about this threat is sil similar to what we do about more conventional threats. We like to deter malicious action before it happens. And we like to be able to defend against incoming attacks, as well as pinpoint where an attack came from. We've gotten better at that because of strong partnerships across the government and because of private sector security researchers like FireEye, CrowdStrike, HP. When they out a group of malicious cyber attackers, we take notice and share that information. Still, adversaries should know that our preference for deterrence and our defensive posture don't diminish our willingness to use cyber options if necessary. And when we do take action, defensive or otherwise, conventionally or in cyberspace, we operate under rules of engagement that comply with international and domestic law. This approach reflects two goals. First, keeping the internet open, secure, and prosperous. And second, assuring that we continue to respect and protect the freedom of expression association, and privacy that reflect who we are as a nation. Let me repeat that second goal. We must continue to respect and protect the freedoms of expression, association, and privacy that reflect who we are as a nation. To do this right, we again have to work together. And as a military, we have to embrace openness. Today, dozens of militaries are developing cyber forces. And because stability depends on avoiding miscalculation that could lead to escalation, militaries must talk to each other and understand each other's abilities. And DOD must do its part to shed more light on cyber capabilities that have previously been developed in the shadows. So today, for example, I want to disclose a recent instance that helps illustrate the cyber threat we face to today and what to do about it. It's never been publicly reported, and it shows how rapidly DOD can detect, attribute, and expel an intruder from our military networks, the, this case unclassified ones. Earlier this year, the sensors that guard DOD's unclassified networks detected Russian hackers accessing one of our networks. They discovered an old vulnerability in one of our le legacy networks that hadn't been patched. While it's worrisome they achieved some authorized access to our unclassified network, we quickly identified the compromise and had a team of incident responders hunting down the intruders within 24 hours. After learning valuable information about their tactics, we analyzed their network activity associated with Russia and then quickly kicked them off the network in a way that minimized their chances of returning. This episode illustrates a step in the right direction. Like a lot of CEOs across the country, my primary goal in my enterprise is defending our networks because we too are a network-centric organization. But I still worry about what we don't know because this was only one attack that we found. One way we're responding to that is by being more transparent to raise awareness in both the public and the private sector. Indeed, shining a bright light on such intrusions can eventually benefit us all, business and governments alike. More broadly, President Obama has said we will respond to cyber attacks in a manner and at a time and place of our choosing, using appropriate instruments of U.S. power. DOD spent a lot of time figuring out how to help do so, while also holding true to our nation's enduring interests, traditions, and values. And we've developed a new cyber strategy that details what our cyber missions are and when we will take certain actions and why. This new strategy, our first since 2011, is to help guide development of DOD cyber forces. And it's also a reflection of DOD being more open than before. We're making it available to the public today, both online and, by the way, at the back of this room. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. 
Like everything we do, our cyber strategy starts with our people. Its first strategic goal is building and training our cyber mission forces. These are talented individuals who hunt down intruders, red team our networks, and perform the forensics that helps keep our system secure. And their skill and knowledge makes them much more valuable than the technology they use. We're just beginning to build and to imagine this cyber force in DOD. Another goal is to be better prepared to defend DOD information networks, secure our data, and mitigate cyber risks to military missions. We do this in part through deterrence by denial in line with today's best-in-class cybersecurity practices, building a single security architecture that's both more easily defendable and able to adapt and evolve to mitigate both current and future cyber threats. This to replace the hundreds of networks, separate networks that now we are now operate in the Department of Defense. We have to strengthen our network defense command and control to synchronize across thousands of these disparate networks and conduct exercises in resiliency so that if a cyber attack degrades our usual capabilities, we can still mobilize, deploy, and operate our forces in other domains, air, land, and sea, despite the attack. And we're also taking action just this week, I directed that we consolidate all of our IT services in DOD and throughout the, DO, the Washington uh, Capital Region, consolidate all of them, which will not only help improve our overall cybersecurity, but also save millions of dollars we could better spend elsewhere. Of course, as I've said, we know that working together is, in the cyber domain is essential. And that's why one of the primary aspects of our strategy is working with partners in the private sector across our government and around the world. And the strategy speaks to this as well. Because American businesses own, operate, and see approximately 90% of our net national networks, the private sector must be a key partner. The US government has a unique suite of cyber tools and capabilities, but we need the private sector to take its own steps to protect its data and networks, and we want to help where we can, but if companies themselves don't invest, our country's collective cyber posture is weakened and our ability to augment that protection is limited. To build our vital cyber force, we're gonna to need to use new ways to attract talent through new private sector exchange programs that let people from outside contribute to our mission and then return here to the valley or to stay, as I did. And to ensure that our people have the right tools to execute their missions, we're gonna be increasing our fundamental research and development. This is an exception in these times of budget constraints. Increase our fundamental research and development with both established and emerging private sector partners in cyber So that today together we can create cyber capabilities that not only help DOD But can also spin off into the wider US marketplace And last to ensure our cyber operations are appropriate and effective We're going to work more closely with our law enforcement partners at FBI with Homeland Security and elsewhere there are clear lines of authority in our government about who can work where. So as adversaries jump from foreign to US networks, we need coordination with our government to operate seamlessly. And I'm determined that the Department of Defense be a cooperative partner with law enforcement and with Homeland Security. We've already started practicing with them. Just a couple weeks ago, we had an exercise that we did with the, our FBI counterparts on how to do exactly what I said. And we're gonna be exercising much more going forward. It's important that we work together and that we all behave in a way that is lawful and appropriate. Now, as Secretary of Defense, my mission is to make sure our military can defend our country, make a better world. But this is a mission that all of us who love freedom and opportunity and want better for our children and our grandchildren share with us. We're at our best when we have the best partners. 
knowing how we've worked together in the past and how critical your work is to our country, strengthening this partnership is very important to me. We have a unique opportunity to build bridges and rebuild bridges and renew trust. That's why I'm visiting some other companies here this afternoon, meeting with a group of tech leaders tomorrow. I want to learn how, in the years to come, a new level of partnership can lead to great things. That's what's possible through partnership. And whether it's helping safeguard the internet or helping save lives, working together for the greater good is bigger than who we are as individuals, bigger than who we are as companies. It's an imperative we face, an opportunity we share, and it's the only way to make a better world together. Thank you.